is uh, David Hendricks. I am the assistant minister here. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. To all who are weary and need rest, to all those who mourn and long for comfort, to all those who are in the valley of the shadow of death and are looking for a shepherd, and to all, and to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her arms of welcome to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself in, uh, invites us uh, to say with him these words from Psalm uh, 118, I shall not die but live and recount the deeds of the Lord. That is our call to worship this morning. And so uh, joining with Christians for millennia who have said this, these words on Sunday morning, see it on the screen, hopefully, um, there you go. Uh, I shall say that, that line with leader, and we all respond uh, if he is risen indeed. So, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Join with me in your hearts as we pray now together. We praise you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Your Son is risen from the dead. And we do thank you for his resurrection, that death had no hold on him, but that death is defeated. And so we, now as as your body are united to Christ, we can say those words, I shall not die, but shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord, those wonderful, majestic, incredible deeds that you have done. Oh, Father, thank you so much for raising your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Thank you that it changes our life, and it gives us a hope and a future. We shall not die. And we shall live. Oh, Father, please now help us as we worship you this morning to recount your deeds, those wonderful, majestic deeds of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand as we are able to sing our first song together. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son.
We come now just briefly to our, our notices for today. There will be a staffed crash uh, starting during the third hymn. So if you've got a young child, uh, please make use of that if you want to. There will be no Sunday school today because it's the holidays. And likewise, no little fishes on uh, Wednesday uh, because of holidays. We will have a big meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock for the prayer meeting. And then for next Sunday, uh, Ruth Hewlett's brother-in-law, yes, uh, Phil uh, Highton from Northwich in Cheshire, Cheshire is preaching. And in the evening, uh, Paul will be preaching as well. Uh, and just a quick reminder with the church AGM coming up to get your church reports if you need to write one ready uh, for the 6th of April. I say that to myself as well as to anyone else. Um, right, uh, it's time to, for the children to come to the front. So primary school age children, come to the front. Um, we get a little spiel from me, and then I think you've got a memory verse and a song to sing for us. So, but yeah, first children, come to the front. No, no, we'll, we'll sit, sit down first. Um. Okay, guys, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, later on in the service, we'll be thinking through uh, something that Mary Magdalene says. After she's seen Jesus risen from the dead, she says, I have seen the Lord. And I want to think about that for a second. But to help us think through that, I want to make it very clear. See this chocolate bar? Nobody, nobody is allowed to eat this. You hear me? Not, not even me. Absolutely nobody is allowed to eat this chocolate bar. Do you understand? No one can eat this chocolate bar. Okay? Whoa! Someone's eating this chocolate bar. Who's eating this chocolate bar? Do you guys know? Me? What are you talking about? I didn't eat the chocolate bar, no. Why do you think, Molly, that I ate the chocolate bar? You saw me. Ah. Oh. Okay, fine, you saw me. Did, did you guys see me eat the chocolate bar? Did you? I think, well, we got some lies on this front row. I, th I think Molly's right. I think you might have seen me at the chocolate bar, but you claim that I, br I, I broke this law and I ate the chocolate bar, but, you know, what if a policeman comes in now and uh, you say, you know, D David ate the chocolate bar. You know, the policeman didn't see me eat the chocolate bar. So how is uh, a policeman supposed to know that I ate the chocolate bar? Do you, Donnie? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, but the thing is, you know, police are often strapped for cash these days. That's an expensive procedure. Let's, uh, let's not bother with that. How else might the policeman know that I ate the chocolate bar? Yeah, Molly? That is also true. Um, but maybe he's got COVID and doesn't have any sense of smell anymore, so he can't smell my breath. How else My yeah, smile? That, okay, I tell them the truth. That is good. Imagine I'm a terrible person. I always lie. But there's, a, there's, a, there's one more answer that we're not getting. Molly? My teeth have dropped. Okay, okay. What, what if the policeman asked you guys? What would you say? You'd say, I ate it. And, and, and how do you know that I ate the chocolate? Because you guys saw it. You guys saw me eat the chocolate bar. In fact, everyone in this room saw me eat the chocolate bar. And so when a policeman comes in off the street, now you're right, he never saw me eat the chocolate bar, but he can ask each and every one of you, and you can all tell him, yes, we were eyewitnesses. We saw it with our eyes. We saw with our eyes David eating the chocolate bar. And if everyone in this room says, yes, we saw with our eyes that David ate the chocolate bar, 
<laughs> and online. There you go. I didn't think about that one. Then, do you think that the policeman would be, should or should not believe you? Do you think he should? Yeah. And that's, that helps us think about the resurrection, right? A policeman who comes in off the street never saw me eat the chocolate bar. But a room full of reliable people say, we saw it with our eyes. Our eyes saw David eating the chocolate bar. Now, that's really helpful for the resurrection. Because here's the thing, guys. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll tell you something. I have never seen Jesus. I've never seen Jesus. I have not seen Jesus rise from the dead. And yet I believe in it. Why? Because just like you guys who saw me eat the chocolate, people who saw Jesus rise from the dead, who saw Jesus alive again from the dead, they wrote it down. And they left it for us. They left these kind of witness statements. You know, sometimes policemen take witness, uh, witness statements. He took down the words of people who saw Jesus written from the, risen from the dead. And so in our Bible, we have these four books called Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And later on, we'll be looking at the Gospel according to John. Now, John saw Jesus risen from the dead, and he wrote it down for us. And Mary Magdalene, who we'll hear about later, she saw Jesus risen from the dead. She was actually the first. And she said, I have seen the Lord. And so how do I know that Jesus risen from the dead? I didn't see it, but Mary did. John saw it, and hundreds of other people saw it. And they wrote it down for us, so that even now, 2,000 years later, when I haven't seen Jesus, reliable people saw Jesus and tell us. And so I, when I listen to reliable people, I should believe them. Just like the policeman believes you that I ate the chocolate, so I believe, John, that Jesus is alive. That's what I have to say for now. It helps us think about the resurrection. We're now, I think, going to swap places. You guys have a Bible verse that you've learned, and I think I'm going to hand over either to Hazel or to James. Um, both. There you go. So I think you guys are coming up here, and I'm sitting on the chair. Um, okay. Rearranged on the platform next to me. Um, if you guys stand on my right, that's probably easiest. Very good. Um, I hope we're all coping well, having lost one hour's sleep last night. Um, yes, yeah, so the children have been working very hard over the last term on their memory verse and their song, which they're about to uh, do for you. Uh, so just to explain what's going to happen, the children will recite their memory verse, and then we're going to have a song. The song's got four verses, so the children will sing the first verse and the chorus, and then everybody else, you guys, join in on the second verse. And I advise, please don't fall asleep during the first verse, because the second verse will come through pretty quickly. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move down there more. swap of maestro and um, I should say a big thanks to three no actually more than three people thanks to Hazel and John for their help um, it's very difficult to run Sunday school by yourself um, so a big thanks to them also thanks to my dad for helping us with the song with the children uh, and finally thanks to the parents for bringing the children along because it would be pretty impossible to do Sunday school with no children all right, and now for the song.
Great, thank you all guys, that was really good. You, you can go back to your seats now, that's good. You're all, you're all done. Thank you. All right, we come now then to our, our pastoral prayer. So again, please pray with me in your hearts. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, Easter is a time for joy, the joy of new life and the joy of resurrection from the dead. But Father, we also acknowledge that this is also a time when people might be grieving those who have died. Um, And so Father, I do pray that you would draw near to those who are grieving right now, uh, for whom this might be an anniversary of our loss even, that you would draw near to them with the comfort of not only your goodness, but also the resurrection of your Son, and those two things together. Father, help us to trust you that what you do is good, and that you are our loving Heavenly Father, and that nothing, nothing can stop your love and your uh, grace and your mercy from coming towards us. And Father, please would we take comfort in the hope of uh, the resurrection from the dead. That as we grieve uh, for those of our brothers and sisters in the Lord who have fallen asleep, that we would grieve with hope, that we would grieve with hope. Father, thank you that when your son, the Lord Jesus, rose Lazarus from the dead, that he still wept. And so thank you that he held together that certainty that he would raise Lazarus from the dead with the, the grief of the ruin and the disgust destruction that death brings, that he could hold those together. And so, Lord, help us hold those together. Let us not deny reality. Let us not deny that death is a horrific, horrendous, and evil thing. Let us, let us also not grieve without hope. Let us grieve our loved ones with the hope of the resurrection that you, uh, you offer all those who come to your Son. And Father, we also want to pray for those who are spiritually dead, that is, uh, those of our friends, families, colleagues, neighbors, and whoever, who do not know you. Lord, thank you for the hope that the resurrection brings us. We would have thought it impossible that someone who is dead comes back alive again. And yet, that is what happened with Jesus, and that is what Jesus did indeed to many other people. And so thank you for the hope that that brings for us, for those who are spiritually dead. Lord, please help us to be good witnesses to those who do not know you and to tell them of the gospel, that great news that Christ rose from the dead for our justification, that we're no longer in our sins and transgressions, we're no longer dead, that we can be alive in him. Father, thank you for that. And please, please, Would you raise up our friends, colleagues, families, neighbors from the spiritual death that they are in? We pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We turn then now to our Old Testament reading. Please turn in your Bibles to Song of Solomon. We'll be reading from chapter 4, verse 12 onwards. There it is, page 679. Six, seven, nine. Okay, here then, uh, the word of God from. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, starting at verse 12, which is in the middle of something that the, 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 the man is saying to his, his love. So, hear then God's word to us. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits. Henna with nard, nard and saffron. Calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, remember that, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices. A garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon, 
Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. The words of the woman, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. The words of the man, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride, I gathered my myrrh with my spice, I ate my honeycomb with my honey, I drank my wine with my milk. The others say, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. And she says, I slept, but my heart was awake, a sound, my beloved is knocking, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment, how could I put it on? I had bathed my feet, how could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved. But my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen found me. As they went about the city, they beat me, they bruised me, they took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick with love. The others speak. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? And the woman says, My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among ten thousand. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So speaks God's word to us. Thanks be to him for it. We now stand as we're able to sing our third him, Christ the Lord, is risen today. And again, the crash will start during this one if you want to make use of that.
with me to uh, John 19 and 20, page 1092. be reading from John 19 verse 38 onwards to John 20 and verse 18. Hear then God's word to us and indeed an eyewitness account that is God's word to us. John 19 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Sorry, then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers 
and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Praise be to God for his word to us. As, as we come to the sermon, uh, let's pray now. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, for, thank you for the feast that you have laid out for us in John chapter 20. Oh, Father, please help me now as I speak. Help us to delight in these precious words that you have given us. Help us to see the truth and the beauty of the resurrection of your Son, so that to him, with you and the Holy Spirit, may go all the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the, the title for this sermon uh, today is The Resurrection, True and Beautiful. And those are the two things I want to communicate to you today, the truth and the beauty of the resurrection. We'll, we'll take uh, this passage mainly preaching from John tw 21 to 18. We'll take it in, in three sections, which I've called the reality of the resurrection, the romance of the resurrection, and the relationship of the resurrection. And we'll, we'll take those as we come then. So firstly then, the reality of the resurrection. Notice especially in the first part of John 20, 1 to uh, 10, there are a lot of details and things there that help us see that this really is a reliable document, that John is recording true, real history, which means then that the resurrection is true. Let me just outline a couple of them for you. Firstly, notice really that this section in John that we've read, really it, it's, it's the story of Mary Magdalene. She starts in verse 1 of John 20, and right at the end, it, it's her message that gets sent out. She's the one in verse 18 who tells the rest of the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She is the first witness of the resurrection. Thomas Aquinas, uh, an old dead Christian theologian, calls her an apostle to the apostles, the one sent to those who would be sent. But here's the thing. If you were making up this story, you would not have Mary Magdalene be your first primary witness. A woman's testimony in those days was not considered reliable. Let me give you an illustration of that. You, you might be familiar that the, um, uh, the Jewish calendar uh, revolves around the moon, the full moons. And so you know when a new month comes, when you have a full moon in the sky. But what if it's cloudy in Jerusalem where the temple is? How will the guys in the temple know if it's a new month? If, there's, if it's cloudy, can't see the new moon? Well, what would have to happen, or what needed to happen, is they need someone who lived where it was not cloudy to come and say, I saw the new moon and it was on such and such a day. Then it's, it's, it's been witnessed, it's verified happy days. But a woman was not allowed to be the witness to see the new moon. Let me read you this from uh, Misha Rosh Hanasha, um, or it says this. Although in certain cases a woman's testimony is accepted, for example, to testify to the death of someone's husband, in the majority of cases, her testimony is not valid. In the majority of cases, her testimony is not valid. So, if I'm John the Apostle and I'm writing this gospel and I want to make it believable, what I would want is for some man, some reliable man, to be the primary witness of the resurrection. But what we have here is a woman, Mary Magdalene, being the primary witness of the resurrection. And almost, do you see how, because it's almost so unbelievable, 
it actually becomes more believable. You would not make this up. If you were making up John's gospel, it would not look like John chapter 20. This is not what a made-up account would look like. That's the, that's the first thing to notice. And then notice uh, the key detail in verse 1 that Mary sees before she sees Jesus risen. Second half of verse 1, Mary sees that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And then later we see that Peter and John see that the tomb is empty. The empty tomb. Now consider the empty tomb for a moment. Consider firstly that no one denies the empty tomb. No, 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 no Christian or no non-Christian, no, no one who is sort of supportive of the Christian cause or no one who is against the Christian cause, no one denies the empty tomb. And so you have to explain the empty tomb. But then consider, if, if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, what your options are. Well, you've got two options mainly. You've got either someone, like maybe one of the disciples, someone in favor of, 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 of Christianity and G this Jesus movement. Maybe one of the disciples nicked the body. Or maybe uh, someone who hated Jesus and this new movement that was beginning. Maybe one of Jesus' enemies stole the body. Well, let's consider those each in turn. Let's consider then a, a disciple nicking the body. Just consider what happened with the rest of the disciples' lives. Okay, they go on. Their lives are absolutely, radically transformed. And all but one of them die for this. They die for this cause. John is the only one who doesn't. But does he get better? He gets sent to a prison colony on the island of Patmos. Right? They all suffer tremendously. Peter, who's in this passage, according to tradition, is crucified upside down. Now consider that you're one of the disciples. There you are, about to be tortured. And you go, Would it make sense to go, look guys, actually, we made the whole thing up. This isn't worth dying for. It was just a bit of fun we had. Sorry about it. No, Jesus, we stole the body. I can show you where it is. No, but he doesn't do that. And consider today, who are the kinds of people who die for their causes? Right? You, soldiers, terrorists, and others. But all of them, they all believe in their cause. They believe it's true. You do not die for something you do not believe is true. Which means that the disciples genuinely believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was genuinely risen from the dead. Okay, well, let's consider then Jesus' enemies. Maybe they uh, stole the body. But then consider why. Why would they do that? This sort of story of the resurrection is really the thing that fans the flames of Christianity and makes this small little kind of local movement a global phenomenon. Now, what better way to put a stop to it right there and then is to go, look, guys, hold the phone, hold your horses. Jesus didn't rise from the dead because, look, here's his dead body. But they never do that. Not one of Jesus' en enemies, be it the Jewish leaders or the Romans or whoever, not one of them says, look, here is the body. Which would have been the perfect thing to do if they had stole the body. So, Jesus' friends and disciples, they didn't steal the body, had no reason to. Jesus' enemies didn't steal the body, otherwise we would know about it. So maybe, just maybe, Jesus' body wasn't stolen. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus rose again from the dead. Um, consider the next... Uh, little uh, observation there, and that is the linen cloths. Do you see how it's repeated a few times there, this detail of linen cloths? I actually read it an extra time for you by accident, so there you go. But at least three times the linen cloths are mentioned. Look at verse 5, 6, and 7. So Peter stoops in, sees the linen cloths lying there. And then John goes in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. And he saw the face cloth which had been lying on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths. Okay, yeah, John, we get it. There were linen cloths there. But that detail is very important. Because if someone had stolen the body, 
which is unlikely already, as we said. If someone had stole the body, cons consider if you were in that, their shoes, what would you do? Here's this body that has been scored, so like the skin is all torn up, there's flesh kind of showing everywhere. It's crucified, it's stinking. Oh, I know what's a good idea. Let's unwrap it. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's exactly what I want to do with a dead body. I want to unwrap a crucified, mangled body that's got a number of holes in it, not least the one in the side and in the hands and the feet. If, you, if you're nicking a body, you're not going to unwrap it. That makes zero sense. And besides, you might have been able to make a little something out of the linen, a bit of money or something. The, 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 you, and, and, and then again, consider, right, there, there are Roman guards stationed outside. John doesn't tell us that, but the other Gospels do. So you've got to do it quickly before they catch you. Oh, but I know, here's a good idea. Let's just take a moment and unwrap each leg, unwrap his body, unwrap his arms. Um. No. If you're going to steal a body, you do not unwrap the linen cloths there and then. The fact that the linen cloths there, that is significant. And also, this, this little face cloth is just lying on the side. I, I really like the ESV translation here. The face cloth, uh, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by its side. side. It's as if Jesus just had that moment to go, you know what, let me just tidy up in here before I leave. Yeah, maybe there's a applica sermon application there for us to you know, tidy our rooms or something. If, if Jesus tidied his tomb, we should do our room. Um, but just, just notice there, the cloths there, not stolen. And then again, not only did Mary see, but then verse 9, um, sorry, not verse 9, uh, verse 8, uh, the other disciples saw, he saw these things as well. It's not just Mary's story. John and Peter all saw these things, eyewitness account. Verse 9, look at verse 9. They did not as yet understand the scripture. It's talking about the Old Testament scripture that Jesus would rise again from the dead. I think an underused uh, argument in favor of Christianity is that you've got like this, all this part of the Bible with loads of promises and prophecies about Jesus that he fulfilled perfectly. John doesn't specify which scripture he has in mind, but there are a number that we could turn to. I think of Psalm, um, Psalm 16, sorry. Um, I can only remember the, the rhyming version. Uh, For you will not allow my soul in death to stay nor will you leave your Holy One to see the tombs decay. The Lord did not leave his Holy One, the Lord Jesus, to see the tombs decay. All these scripture promises about Jesus that he fulfills. And so as we just kind of take a step back and look at the evidence that John has, we have a woman as the primary witness. We have um, the empty tomb, and then it makes no sense uh, that anyone would have stolen the body. We have further evidence of that with the linen cloths lying there. We have also then John's testimony and Peter's testimony, and we have then Old Testament prophecy, at least five things in this passage that seem to suggest that what John 20 says really happened, and this is a reliable account for us, the reality of the resurrection, that Jesus really did rise again from the dead. So that's that first point, the, the reality of the resurrection. I now want to turn, turn to my second point, which I've yeah, called the romance of the resurrection. I'll explain, don't worry. Often in the Bible, you see patterns. God often does things in the same way multiple times. And I want to just quickly highlight for you a pattern of uh, the, the broader pattern would be a woman longing for her husband in the garden or in a garden. A woman longing for her husband in the garden. It's a pattern we see over scripture. We see it firstly in Genesis, the garden, the garden of Eden. We have there the woman. And in Genesis 3.16, there's this phrase that God says to her as, as after the fall, your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, that phrase, your desire shall be for your husband, is very complex. And there's multiple aspects to it. Uh, it's interesting that in the next chapter, sin's desire is for Cain. So there's 
certainly a negative side to it. But there's an echo as well, not only to Sin's Desire for Cain, but in Song of Songs. We didn't read this bit of Song of Songs earlier. But in Song of Songs, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, the woman says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. So we start, uh, which is, it seems positive there, right? So we start with this ambiguous desire of the woman, your desire will be for your husband, in a garden, in Genesis. That's the seed. And then we come, as we, and we re read this earlier then, to Song of Songs. That was our fir first Old Testament reading. And the, uh, the most compelling thing about Song of Solomon is that it seems that the woman is the most active character in it. She is longing for her love. Longing, and we saw there in the garden. Remember, the, 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 the husband says, my beloved is this locked fountain, a, a locked fountain and a locked garden. I want to come into this garden. There were myrrh and aloes, uh, aloes or aloes, I don't know how to pronounce, say that word there, which we'll pick up in a moment. And we have this desire, this woman desiring her husband and not quite finding him. Combined with then that echo we saw later in the Song of Solomon, I am my beloved and his desire is for me. So we see this theme again, this woman longing for her husband or her, or her fiance, depending on where they are, in a garden. And now taking this sort of thread, let's bring it into John 20. So notice in chapter 19, verse 41, we're in a garden. We are in a garden. That now, verse 31, now the place where he was crucified, not in the place, sorry, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb. We're in a garden again. Ooh, this feels like Eden, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Notice what Nicodemus brings with him in verse 39. Myrrh and al al aloes. Uh, again, e echo of Song of Solomon. So we're starting to see we're in this garden. Then what do we see? We see Mary Magdalene, full of desire for this man. Twice she's asked, woman, why are you weeping? And that phrase, woman, it doesn't really translate well into English. The angels and Jesus are not being rude when they call Mary Magdalene woman. That is the polite way of addressing a woman in, in Greek. Um, in English, it doesn't really come across, but no translation really does. Like, you can't say, woman, why are you crying? Or lady, why are you crying? They don't quite sound the same. This is a, this is a, a polite, respectful way of addressing a woman. But the angel's there. Woman, why, who are you seeking? Jesus says, Woman, whom are you, uh, why are you crying? Whom are you seeking? There's this, this desire for her man um, from, from, from Mary. Notice again that Jesus is the gardener, or, or certainly that Mary thinks he's the gardener. Again, echoing these, this garden imagery. And then we've already had in John uh, the picture of Jesus as the bridegroom. And we've been, we've been doing this on our Tuesday night Bible studies. We Remember, if you think, in, in John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. But where does he turn water into wine? At a wedding. And whose job is it to, prov to provide wine? The bridegroom. But who provides the wine in John chapter 2? Jesus. Jesus doing the job of the bridegroom. Oh, okay. Then in John chapter 3, John the Baptist explicitly calls Jesus the bridegroom, and styles himself as the best man. And then in John chapter 4, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman by the well, which is this very romantic location in, in the Old Testament. A well is a very romantic location. And this woman has had five husbands. She's now with, living with a sixth man, and she's now just met Jesus, the seventh man. If you know your Bibles, you'll know that seven is the number of God's perfection. She has literally just met Mr. Perfect by the romantic well. Jesus here styling himself as the bridegroom. And I think John is picking up these themes again in John 20. Here we have this woman longing for her husband or for her, her man in that sense. And we have Jesus, who we've already been primed to think of in terms of bridegroom categories. He is the one she is longing for. 
But compare then Jesus as a bridegroom with the other bridegrooms from Eden and Song of Solomon, right? In the Garden of Eden, when Mary longs for her husband, what happens? Well, Adam isn't a very good husband in the Garden of Eden. Sin and the fall happens, and what does he do? He blames Eve. He says, God, the woman you put in the garden with me, it's her fault. She, he throws Eve under the bus. Come to Song of Solomon's, again, the woman longing for her beloved. And he's not there. He's not there. He didn't wait. Like, she's like, I don't want to get out of bed, but I'll find I'll get out of bed. It takes a while, but he's run out of patience and he's gone. <sighs> Compare that then with the bridegroom that we see in John 20. Look at all the things that he does. Let me just highlight some of them for you. Um, also, sorry, sorry, also notice, sorry, then Mary's love for the bridegroom and how Jesus treats her. Firstly, notice in verse um, 15, Mary says to the gardener, to Jesus, Sir, if you have carried him away, and so on. Notice, she hasn't spoken to this gardener before. The gardener doesn't know that she's looking for Jesus. But she just says, him. She just says, him. She doesn't explain who the him is, who he is. So if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Thomas Aquinas talking about who is the him here. He says this. We should say that the force of love causes the lover to think that no one would be ignorant of the one who is always in his or her thoughts. When you're in love, the one you love is so filling your thoughts, you just assume that everyone else is completely enamored and enthralled with love for the same person. Him. It's the him. She doesn't say, by the way, I'm looking for this guy called Jesus. No. Him. If you've taken him away, of course you know who he is. He's all my heart. He's all my affection. He's all my desire. And then she, look at what she said. I will take him away. Really, Mary? Really? You're going to carry the dead, heavy body of a man. You're just going to go fetch him? That's, that's, it's, not, it's probably not impossible. That's a lot of work, but do you see how much love compels her? Of course she's going to try. That's what love does. Love will attempt to do the impossible because that's what love does. That's what love does. And how then does Jesus treat Mary? I love this. He speaks to her heart. He says her name. Verse 16, Jesus says to her, Mary. But do you notice that she replies in Aramaic? Can you see that? So she replies, Rabboni, which means teacher. Why does Mary reply in Aramaic? It's because, you can't see it here, but it's because Jesus says the Aramaic version of her name. So here, John's Gospel, as we said earlier, it's written in Greek. Now, the Greek for Mary is Maria. But the Aramaic is Mariam. Say an M on the end. Mariam. Think of uh, Moses' sister. Mariam. And so, if you consider what it's like to be a person there, Aramaic, that's the language of home. That's the language you think in, the language you dream in, the language you pray in. Greek is the language of commerce, the language of the invader, invaders from a couple hundred years earlier. Greek is this foreign imposition, but Aramaic is your heart language, your mother tongue, the language that from your earliest days, your parents would have spoken to you in. And so Jesus does not say Maria, the Greek version. No, he says Maria. He speaks to her heart. There's something wonderful about saying her name like that. A name is a profound thing. Consider, consider Swanee, my wife. Swanee is not her name. Swanee's the English nickname we give her because English people can't say Santia. 
And in this moment, it's as if Jesus is not saying swanny to her, although everyone calls her swanny. As if he's saying, Santia. He's saying your name. There's, there's, like, he's saying her name. He's speaking to her heart. He's speaking with affection. And then Mary replied, Rabuni or Rabona, which means teacher. Now, again, that is wonderful there. Again, speaking in Aramaic, Rabboni is similar to the word rabbi, which you might be familiar with. Rabbi meaning, you know, teacher or master or something. It's what you call, well, your teachers, hence the word meaning teacher. But what about that funny ending, Rabboni or Rabunai? That's the diminutive in Aramaic. Now, in English, we don't really have the diminutive. We kind of do, but not, not as, as much as other languages. So the diminutive is when you want to make something slightly smaller, and normally you, you use it for, for affection. So uh, in, in Spanish, it's adding the ito at the end. So imagine you have someone called Juan. If you want to be affectionate towards Juan, even if he's not small, or maybe he is small as well, you might say Juanito, like little Juan. Uh, in German, you add Chien at the end, hien, hien. So, um, so sometimes Eliana, is, is our little girl, she has little feet. So in German, it's Fuß is the word for feet, but I sometimes say Fußchen, or in the dialect, the diminutive is Fußle, like little affectionate feet, which is Eliana's feet. In English, the, maybe the closest we get is let, adding let to an end of the word. So uh, think of uh, ring, but then hair can be ringlets. Or a pig, a little pig is a piglet. Or sometimes we add E to the end. So dog, doggy, horse, horsey. Charles, Charlie, Catherine, Kathy. That's the diminutive. Sorry, that's your school lesson over, sorry. Um, but I, I, I labor that point because Rabuni, again, you just can't capture it in English. But it, it, it's both this term of respect, rabbi, master, teacher, but it's Rabuni. There's, there's, a, there's affection there. It's both respectful and affectionate. And I just think that is just the perfect way to address Jesus. Rab Rabboni, Rabuni. Affectionate master. I, you can't, I can't say it in English. But do you, do you hear that love and affection between them? Jesus says, Mariam. And she says, Rabboni. And so that is, that is, if you like, the romance of the resurrection. Now, romance is the wrong word, maybe, because Jesus and Mary Magdalene, contrary to what Dan Brown would have you believe, didn't have a thing going on. And actually, the rest of Scripture, though, tells us. That who is the bride of Christ? Who is the bride of Christ? It's us. It's the church. And so almost, my friends, what you can do is, kind of with your imaginations, you can Position yourself in Mary Magdalene's shoes. And you can seek desperately your husband, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can say, where is he? Where is my Lord? And he can turn to you and speak your name to each and every one of you. Woman, why are you crying? In the best words you know how, with respect and affection. That is the romance of the resurrection, which we are all invited to take part in with our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then just lastly, then the relationship of the resurrection. See, uh, romance isn't the only category that we can think about in terms of what the resurrection has accomplished for us. The relationship as well. Notice what Jesus calls his disciples in verse 17. But go to my brothers, he tells Mary Magdalene. His disciples, he now calls them brothers. And by extension, he calls us brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers all together, part of the family. And Jesus then says, I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. This other uh, result of the resurrection is welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. John begins and finishes his gospel in the same way. At the beginning of John, in John chapter 1, it says, 
But to all who did receive him, that's the Lord Jesus, to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God, my friends, that is what is on offer for us. The Lord, the Father is Jesus' Father by nature and our Father by grace, our Father by adoption. And because of the resurrection, that is now a reality. We can be adopted into the family. And so let me finish by saying this, just pointing out two turnings that happen in this passage. The first, if you look in verse 14, Mary turns around, says, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. My friends, maybe some of you are at that first turning. Here you are at church, if you, you've turned here and you've, and you've seen the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead, seen him with the eyes of faith as he's given to us in God's word. You've seen Jesus, but you have not known it was Jesus. You have not recognized him as Jesus. My friends, I invite you to do the second turning in this passage. Look in verse 16 when Jesus says, Mariam, what does it say? She turned. She turned again and said to him, Rabboni. There are two turnings here. Friends, I invite you, I plead with you to make that second turning. As Jesus calls your name this morning, calling your name, turn to him. Turn to him. See him for who he is. The Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Lord and Savior, turn to him and say to him, Rabboni. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, we turn to you now. We turn to you with respect and affection. Oh Lord, we love you. We love you. We desire you. We long for you. Oh, Lord, I do pray that you would help us always to put ourselves in Mary's shoes here in this passage and to live lives of desiring for you, longing for you, because you are everything we have longed for. You are the, the, the bridegroom of us, the church. And I do pray, Lord, for all those here or listening who who have not seen you for who you are, that they would turn and see you for who you are and seeing you would love you, love you and know you as the risen Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, thank you that you welcome us into your family. We thank you, thank you for that welcome. And so to you, with your Father and with the Holy Spirit, be all glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We stand as we're able then to sing our final song, See What a Morning.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.